Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by money. Episode 305, On Device AI and React Native with Gant Laborde. Hey, it's me again. Before we start the episode, I wanted to let you know that we're hiring here at Infinite Red. My name is Todd. I'm the CEO, and I'm also the guy who does the silly intros for this podcast. We're looking for a few senior React Native engineers to join our team here full time. You have to be in the USA. You have to be senior level in React Native. You have to be kind, willing to work with clients, and it really helps if you enjoy silliness. As I'm here, there's lots of silliness. Hopefully good silliness, but, you know. We're fully remote, always have been, always will be. We all have families and or personal lives, so we strictly stick to a healthy work-life balance. If you're interested, go to careers.infinite.red and fill out our form. Okay, back to our episode. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to React Native Radio. You've probably noticed that I do not sound like Jamin. Who's that, Jamin? It's because I'm not Jamin. What? <laughs> Crazy, I know. Jamin is out. <laughs> I feel like he won't be mad if I tell the audience this, but... I feel like he will. Do it anyway. Jamin is out dealing with head lice, which has befallen his household. And so I'm your your host for the day. Uh, one of the things we do when we prepare an episode is come up with an adjective to describe the hosts, which a lot of you love about our episodes. And since the topic today involves AI, I thought I decided to have ChatGPT invent an adjective, um, and it was quite the process <laughs> coming up with something. At first, it was just like, "Here, I'm going to smush two words together," and it came up with "radiantastic." <laughs> radiantastic, like radiating, fantastic. Yeah, it's it, it's an alternative to degreetastic. You use radiantastic. Radiant and fantastic. Um, it came up with sparkificent. Harry Potter. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Harry Potter is spark isn't Spark and Mag- and then I was like, no, 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 I don't want it. I don't want you to just smush two words together. I want you to actually come up with a new word. And it came up with luminal, which Jed, our producer, said sounded like a pharmaceutical. Mm-hmm. And I buy it. I buy it. Wait till you hear the side effects that come with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it came up with brivious, which. I don't know, it didn't sound that cool to me. What, what was its definition for Brivius? Someone who exudes a natural and effortless brilliance, inspiring those around them with their creativity, intelligence, and positive spirit. Oh. I don't know where it got that. It kind of... I think it mushed two words there. It's like, it sounds like brave and like courageous. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. A it was getting mentor. better. So it didn't but listen you'll, to you'll hear But you'll, you'll hear the word that um, we ultimately shows <laughs> in just a second uh so i better get on with with our introductions i am robin hines of course i'm the director of engineering at infinite red i'm located west of portland oregon with my husband and my two kids and i've specialized in react native for the past seven years i think seven years now and i'm joined by my drum roll let's hear it voluptuous co-host mazin belligerent 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 <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what that, that I don't I mean it's a made up word, so it's also a made up pronunciation, so I'm I'm making it up. <laughs> Voluptuous. V E L I T U O U S. What's which... the uh what's the origin of the word? <laughs> Can you use Could it you use sentence? it in a sentence? <laughs> Other than <laughs> Chat GPT is the origin. Twenty twenty four. <laughs> is this uh is this greek or latin we need to know uh i i wonder what the first ai created word in the oxford english dictionary will be oh maybe call. it will be voluptuous possessing an innate <laughs> charm and grace that naturally draws others in Ooh. i don't know i think we should submit it i think we should <laughs> do it uh you've already heard his voice but now you'll hear his name 
We also have uh, a lovely guest, Gant Laborde, who is our CIO extraordinary. He lives in New Orleans, Louisiana, with his wife and his little daughter. <laughs> and he's an AI enthusiast and author of the O'Reilly book, Learning TensorFlow.js, which is a good yeah. book. You should pick it up if you don't have it already. Yeah, you can pick it up at any O'Reilly Auto Parts store. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, O'Reilly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, know they hate that at that they publisher, do. right? They're uh, just like, we're popular, but we don't have a jingle. <laughs> you missed the boat on that one. Do we have a jingle? <laughs> we should we should have one. <laughs> in in infinite red. <laughs> <laughs> React native code. <laughs> <He's right. laughs> we should have we should have Derek write us a jingle for real oh, I, yeah, or I could have AI write us a jingle if you'd like <laughs> ooh I love that Cons do it Gant. consider it done next episode be a, listen for it alright yeah. without further ado our topic for today is on device AI in React Native with of course Gantt Laborde a lot of people know us for our React Native work of course but uh, they may not know that we were also extremely early to AI. And by we, I mean Gantt, <laughs> who's been doing this for how many years now, Gantt, when, when you first picked oh, up AI and machine uh, learning? Over five years over five now. Years. So, yeah, we, were, we mm. were doing it before it was cool. Actually, like seven years. <laughs> seven years. Where's time Stop going? Stop making up numbers, Gantt. <laughs> what are you going to do? Fact check me? I'm hallucinating here. <laughs> sounds like sounds like the episode where we you all had Todd on and he was going to make up random numbers, percentages, and stuff. <laughs> Doesn't yeah, everybody do that? Yeah. I will say, I've had people reach out to me in my community and networking that I do and mentoring, um, and they've actually asked me to help put them in touch with Gantt because they've said while researching Aww. AI and React Aww. Native, Gantt's <laughs> names come up. So Gantt is the go-to, and I did actually get to work with Gantt for a little. Stint, oh yeah um preparing for a potential ai client that we had and that that was really cool yeah i i really really enjoy ai yeah what what sparked your interest in ai and got you like into ai again dude i gotta say there's a new influx of people into technology and i don't know what their aha moment is but mm -hmm. um there's always been things that computers did i was just like oh that's so cool i have to make that happen uh it, it for me i'm so old it was just making the computer actually say hi <laughs> i was just like oh yeah that's great <laughs> hello world was my wow this is amazing that's, moment i feel like a lot of everyone had their hello world moment like oh my gosh i just did something that made the computer talk to me how cool right. is that if you're a developer and you type hello without the trailing w <laughs> You are not a real developer that started with Hello World, in my opinion. <laughs> hello W is always how I write hello. I've sent Hello W to my wife a couple times, and she's been like, W question mark? I'm like, forget it. You're, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Long story. It, it, like, it, Long story. it's it goes back to when I was 12. If you think about it, you know, that's think about the first time you made JavaScript do a pop up or, you know, you made web do something. Or the first time you made a phone do something. It's just like this amazing moment where you've seen technology do something and you're like, this is where the world is going. And I had that moment with AI and that was just, that was just it. I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, oh my God, I could do this. This is where everything's going. Uh, so back yeah. in 2017, I went full force into AI. But nobody else, nobody else had realized it yet. So you were just like <laughs> the lone wolf in the desert being like, this is cool. Everybody pay attention. <laughs> I, I would love to say that that was, uh, that was the case. But I think the world kind of woke up to AI in 2012 is when uh, there was just this ability to do things at human-like intelligence with near human capabilities and people said wow and then they got closer closer and then surpassed human like capabilities and it's just uh i was probably late to that game <laughs> but I, which is so um, crazy because yeah. i was in my senior year of college in 2012 mm -hmm. and one of my professors was like really pushing this like machine learning stuff and i was like yeah this is it was it was a chore for me because mm -hmm. it was it was difficult and i was like what it yeah it like it didn't 
it hadn't like the spark hadn't been like oh this is going to be like the future of the world i should probably pay attention and if i could go <laughs> back in time i would work harder on understanding it and maybe go into the field when i had the chance you know that that's this kind of thing but it, as long as you have the aha moment i feel like it doesn't matter there's always that saying like when should you start saving for your 401k the best day was yesterday the second best day is today like we can only learn from our past and kind of go forward. And then to me, from my past, I've seen technology move forward. Uh, I've seen mobile apps become all the rage. And I was like, oh, I should have learned how to code mobile apps to catch that whole wave. Yeah. I, you know, I was way ahead on web. I was way behind on mobile, but you know, I've obviously caught up and way on top of uh, React Native. You know, just as soon as React Native came out, I was the first one of the first people contributing back to it. Um, I was in the top 100 contributors to React Native for the, the open source repository, building Ignite, things like that. And uh, I think what's great about it is you just start to see these bubbles start to show up and people start to say, OK, uh, this might be something. I was like, I know it's going to be something. <laughs> I missed that train three or four times and now I'm catching them. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So mm -hmm. let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, big picture obviously if if you're awake uh you've realized that ai is <laughs> is everywhere and it's kind of wowing people right now and becoming a part of products all over the place products that like used to be something else are now like ai powered mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's be it's become a bit of a marketing thing but what are y'all's favorite uses of ai in apps that you use regularly maz and i'll mm. start with you yeah so not sure if you've all heard of the app Wavelength. It's a pretty cool one because what it does is it brings AI into the chat. That's basically what it does. So, for example, my wife and I have a chat group where we only use it to help us with a meal plan. So we'll mm -hmm. say, at AI, here's what we have in the fridge. Give me three, you know, um, dishes. And then it'll give you three dishes and then you'll be like, all right, AI, can you dig into, you know, what this dish, you know, give me a couple recipes for this dish. And we kind of expand it that way. We also use it for like toddler um, game ideas. So like, hey, you know, at AI, we saw this game online. How can, you know, what do I need to do to build this? Uh, if it's mm -hmm. like something like, you know, get some wood pellets and stuff like that. Um, and actually, I use it with a friend for sports. It's funny. How, like we have our iMessage chat going. But when it comes time, like when we ask a question, like my friend the other day was like, who won the March Madness five years ago? And right away, I switched over to Wavelength. I asked the AI group and he like put in the chat, LOL. He's like, I should have just done it in here in the first place. <laughs> Type of thing. We, so, that's really cool. I should yeah. try that with my husband. Yeah. We, um, we, actually, we meal plan, our like meal planning strategy right now is just sending each other Instagram reels with recipes in them. Same. Mm -hmm. Back and nice. forth forever. Mm -hmm. And then, like, there's a recipe I want from three months ago, and, like, yeah. I, I'm never going to find this again. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. Usually that recipe starts on Instagram reel. We pull out the recipe, we put it in the wavelength, wavelength, and then we ask Wavelength, like, hey, we don't have these ingredients. What are yeah. replacements online that you find, for example? Mm -hmm. And they do have a Mac app. It's only iOS specific. So it's I iOS, sorry, iPhone, iPad, Mac for now. That's really mm -hmm. cool. I'm actually going to... Go and try that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Gian, what about you? Um, inside products, I'm really loving the fact that people are starting to bring uh, recommendation engines into LLMs, which gives you sort of a virtual assistant slash um, concierge experience. So I love that Spotify now has like a DJ inside of it. And before the DJ plays some songs, they tell you, hey, these are some new songs and some old songs from a playlist or this or that. And it's kind of nice. I have my own personal you know, DJ who's figuring out songs and playing them for me. And uh, if I fast forward a song, I know that the DJ gets a little bit smarter. Or if I pass on it, they're going to go ahead and improve it. Um, so inside products is great. But also outside of that, new products just doing generative uh, AI is always magical. One of my favorite things now is generating songs with uh, Suno.com. So like I said, I can get a jingle yeah. for us in no time. <laughs> that would be so cool. If I had to pick a, a favorite from recently, 
Um, so we've been testing out this um, new video chatting uh, app called Multi recently, which is really great for screen sharing and pairing and stuff. But their AI features are pretty next level. And um, after you end a meeting, it gives you this AI summary. So if you like weren't taking notes during the meeting, it's really good at parsing out like what action items were either stated explicitly or even kind of implied Mm -hmm. uh, and like pulling out the key themes of the meeting um, and just like creating this nice little summary, really powerful stuff. Unfortunately, they just, just yesterday they announced that they have been sold to OpenAI and they're shutting down the app. Oh no. Oh, by the way, Robin, I have a piece of cake that you can't eat. Would you like to hear about it? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so that's a pretty useless recommendation, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the tech will emerge. So, I mean, if OpenAI is buying the company, that hopefully the tech will s- still emerge somewhere else. But yeah, that's been my favorite recently, unfortunately. That's a very, it's a very good tool for sure. You can still use it for another month. So <laughs> yeah, use it, get really into it. And then all of a sudden it's gone. So sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, I hope OpenAI does bring it back in some capacity. Yeah. Maybe oh, yeah. maybe they'll use it to expand, you know, ChatGPT's features, and then eventually, you know, grow on it in some some way or form. Well, on that note, Kent, and kind of what you mentioned about LLMs, yeah. LLMs that are used in you know to power ChatGPT, for example, they're huge, they're humongous. Mm-hmm. Can you give us some insight into that? And would that yeah. even be possible to? run on a device, mobile device? Yeah, absolutely. So what's great about this is people measure these things by parameters. And if you've ever had somebody break open a neural network for you, you see all these neurons or these nodes. And then between those, you see these weights and biases. Those weights and biases are the magic numbers that make that model work. What's funny is that a model starts at a certain size. And so when you start an LLM, a large language model, you start it huge, like a giant, giant, giant file. And then all it does is just tune those billions upon billions of parameters between all those nodes to become the numbers that make the magic happen. If you take an untrained model and then ask it what to do, it'll spit out gibberish. I've actually built a couple of websites showing how a model before it's trained it just basically is like randomness generator. Hmm. And then because it was weighted with random numbers. And then eventually through a little bit of calculus, it kind of figures out how to make those things better and better and better. And it has these huge floating point numbers for these values. Well, what happens is uh, we're trying to figure out what nodes after it's been trained are the ones that are actually making the difference happen. Can you group some together and still keep the accuracy high? And then here's another thing. Quantizing models is another cool thing where you're, instead of taking these huge floating point numbers, can you bring them down to like int eights or something like that? Can you just make the numbers take up less space in memory and still get the model to go ahead and give you those valid calculations? So when you're doing all these things, we're bringing the size of the model down and we're finding out that there's entirely sparse networks of, of these neurons that, that could be compressed in some way. It's just that we haven't figured out a lot of those things. Secondly, followed by the fact that we are continuing to make AI on, AI on device chips. So all of us have phones with AI chips on them. And what that does is that allows them to run those linear algebra, those those inferences better. But those things could do all kinds of stuff. You could actually probably eventually even have like an LLM chip on there that becomes like hydrated with the mini LLM that needs to be there. And I could see that in the future, we're going to see the same kind of gravitation towards AI on devices that we've seen with like every other AI on device we've seen. For instance, uh, voice to text used to be a server only option where you would go ahead and you'd speak directly into your phone. It would send that off to the server and then come back with the text that was necessary for it. Then they've, you know, Apple's like, guess what? We've moved a lot of this to on device. And then, so when you type the, when you say like voice to text on your phone, now yeah. you can see it actively <clears throat> filling out the information 
But then the low confidence words, the ones where it has the least confidence, it sends those off to a much larger server and comes back. So if you're a, you're an old dude like me who loves voice to text, and I know I'm like dating myself here. Right? <laughs> there's an Anytime age. Some, there's like an there's age a cutoff where immediately you start doing all of your texts out loud. It's so useful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, dude, I get it. You could swipe super fast. I will be fast. there in a minute, period. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's, it's a little bit of that and getting bigger phones, to be honest. Like, I have long fingers, but I, I have, like, the giant Pro Max, like, holding... It, that's a two-handed phone at any given moment. I could voice the text <laughs> with one hand, right? And so what happens is I hit the button, I say it. It says the sentences out there. You can see what's going on device. It sends the low-confidence patches out to the server, comes back with, like, these impressive, like, fixing... So what we'll start to see is just like in anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like, remember, history doesn't exactly repeat itself, but sure as hell rhymes. We're going to get mm -hmm. this moment where we're going to see this client server architecture between on device and server for LLMs, where we will have LLM chips, we'll have LLM on device technology, where it'll figure out where uh, you'll have sort of, can I handle this here? And if not, where do I send it off to, to come back and kind of give you the least amount of network traffic and the most capable, like uh, offline capability at the same time. You talked a lot about it being on the device, but then also sending yeah. it to the cloud. What's the benefit of, obviously, other than data and internet connectivity, which I feel like at this point, almost everybody, I yeah. almost in quotes, almost everybody <laughs> has, right? What are the benefits of even having it on the device in the first place? Yeah. If you can just send it to the cloud and just get that actual really high confidence back yeah. instead of, you know, burning your a hole in your hand from holding your phone in the battery, <laughs> heating through because it's doing right. so much processing yeah. on device. What's the benefit? Well, that round trip doesn't work for some things. For instance, let's say I was doing AI vision. If I'm trying to go ahead and do AI vision, uh, sure, I could take a picture of a screw have it go off to the server, and I want to find the exact screw for that. I want to know exactly what to buy. Hit me with the best thing you could possibly have. Bring that back. That's an opportunity where you say, please give me the best, most badass model on the cloud, mm -hmm. and then you know just bring it back to me. Um, you see this also with, uh, with services and such. But what happens is there's some things that are just not even practical. Like, let's say I'm setting it up and I'm watching a basketball game and I'm having it kind of check for a particular move or something like that. That has to be on device because that has to be running at 60 frames per second. And right, so uh, right. just sort of like yeah. the saturation we were talking about a second ago, if we're taking in audio or video or something like that, there's this marriage of the fact that on device, one defers the cost that's necessary because your your phone with the correct chips isn't going to kind of burn through your memory. It's actually going to handle it just fine. Yeah. Detecting faces, handling all this other stuff that it's been uh, that that actually the inference on device can happen in microseconds. So giving that part to the device and getting that immediate feedback is really nice. The other thing is that, like I said, it's offline capable. You don't have to worry about, uh, you, you could kind of uh, add more features without increasing the cost to the application as well. Because uh, every time you're hitting your server, that's costing you money. When you ship something into the actual device, into your app, that's just costing the power on the app. Now, you do have to make sure the trade-off, you, like I said, you don't want to, you don't want to fry people's pockets. But Take a look at <laughs> GPS, right? Like as GPS, we've optimized that to really figure out how to um, to have GPS on in an app and no longer like kill your battery. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago that you're like, why is my battery dead? Oh my God, this thing's tracking my location. And then yeah. now it's dead, right? So these sort of optimizations really make sense to figure out what's important. There's another last piece here they'll say is like privacy. There was that whole idea. Yeah. Remember the Russian agent aging app where you take a picture and it would tell oh, you like what you yeah. looked like. And it somehow it sending got everyone, a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, look at this fun little little game that like, yeah. everyone see what you're going to look like. I was like, you just sent all of your faces. You just sent yeah. to Russia. Exactly. And then so there's that there's this privacy concern that happens with sending things over the network that I think people are way more amicable to having stuff run on device than sending some kind of meta information off over the wire uh, and watching what kind of gets sent there. Like if you wanted to take a look at me and, 
and uh, see whether I'm happy or not. I think what's a cool thing is check my facial sentiment on device. And then maybe I'd be okay if you sent like happy or sad or like I'm enjoying this or not. But you're sending my face. I start to have a problem with that because Mm -hmm. that data could be used for a whole bunch of things uh, that I can't get a control of once it's been uh, off my device. Yeah. Yeah. Let's bring this to React Native. We're mm-hmm. we're obviously React Native developers, and so anything where you're talking about running it on device as part of an application, we're like, can you do this with React Native? So yeah. what's the answer to that at this point in time? Well, one of the greatest things that's happened is React Native is just this beautiful way of running on multiple platforms. So it's like, give it to me, let me run everything on every platform and make sure it works. Uh, with AI, it starts to get, I can tell you this, the AI model structure and inference and framework world has gotten this big, interesting fight, right? So maybe I want to use the framework called PyTorch, or maybe I want to use TensorFlow or this or that. And that can become a problem because somebody can show up with a great solution that you're like, I have no idea how to plug this into my app, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately... I will say this is one of the spots where Google is amazing. Their capability of running AI on devices that is optimized for the device and runs really quick and runs on multiple devices, including iOS and Android, is really good. And so they've done a lot of work in TensorFlow, making TensorFlow Lite models, which are optimized for edge devices. And then lastly wrapping that whole thing in a framework called MLKit, which gives you access to custom models, but also really tested, extremely useful models that are amazing at running on device. And so what's the process of bringing that to React Native? And has that process already started? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, as I love is that Masa knows the answer to this, and I know the answer to this, and, and Robin, an you probably know the question. answer to this, but, <laughs> but I want to make sure... So what's really great is MLKit has a huge library of options that it can do. Text recognition, digital ink recognition, detecting poses, selfie segmentation, which is like removing you from your background, all this cool stuff that we want to do already. You don't have to train the model. You don't have to go find the model. You don't have to figure out how to make it run on iOS and Android. MLKit does that, but it does it in native code. So MLKit's a great solution, but fortunately enough, we've been working on our own library, which brings the native code in to work perfectly with React Native, and that's React Native MLKit under the uh, Infinite Red brand. Now, there is somebody who also has a GitHub repository called React Native MLKit, but we're the one under Infinite Red. Mm -hmm. And so we've been slowly taking over these features like... Uh, scanning faces, object detection, uh, labeling, and document scanning, and then taking those cool features and bring them in so that you could just, within a few lines of code, run those MLKit libraries so that they run effectively. If they're supported in iOS and Android, runs for both of them. If it's just supported for one, it runs for one of them. Document scanning is Android only. Yeah. Um, and this is all open for source. For now. Yeah, for now, of course. And this is all open source. So you could go to that GitHub repo that Gantt mentioned and take a look at it. And I will say I am currently fighting the Apple Store reviews <laughs> daily right so now. So we can get I got out, that. Yeah. I got that email. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And today's was email like, oh, was crazy. Gantt's not going to be happy about that one. They attached like <laughs> 10 screenshots of not liking some stuff. And anyways, oh, th- yeah, that goes classic. to like, you know. Classic bringing in the words Google into Apple's ecosystem yeah. type of thing. So that, that's kind of where that friction is coming from. But yeah. yes, to answer your question, Robin. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it'll be. Th- that's the yeah, fingers crossed, start. yes. So, yeah. so the idea of the app here is that we've been, uh, yeah, you can pull down the code and you can kind of like see how it works. The problem is you're going to want to run that on a device. Right. Yes. You know, I don't want to run on a simulator. You're going to want to run it on a device. You want to see what are the capabilities that this can do. So we came up with the idea, like, let's go ahead and release this to the App Store. So every time we get a new feature, let's say um, there's that feature of uh, automatic reply. Right. So that's one of the cool things that comes in MLKit. 
Which Gmail has been doing forever, which is Gmail has been like doing Google, it. It's awesome. Google's clearly had this technology for a long time. Dude, I, I love I love that. And then um, entity extractions, the other one. Um, where it's like, if I sent you a bunch of times, dates, and places, I could kind of pull those out of a super cool feature. Yeah. Also, Gmail has been doing that forever. Yeah. And I've, I've, I love mm-hmm. that feature. Yeah. So, so let's say you want to add that to a product to one of your apps. Let's say, for instance, you wanted smart reply just to go ahead and add it into a chat app that you have there. And, you know, what one, do you have a PhD in computer science and machine learning? No. Uh, two, <laughs> Do you do you want to write the framework from scratch? No. Three, do you want to go ahead and train the model from scratch? No. Four, do you want to just go pull something off the shelf and bring it into your React Native product so that you can say, hey, um, I'll grab that eight-point ticket and just bring in the uh, React Native ML kit from Infinite Red. They've added this new feature for smart reply support and then bring that in. So let's say that you want to see what that looked like before you did that effort. That's why we want to have an app in the store. You can just like download and try some of these. So right now we've ported over four of the ML kit features to be able to be used and kind of check them out. But as we add more features or as people have needs, or if we add some stuff for a client and we want to kind of demonstrate that, the app should be there. So the app is effectively just like, hey, this is possible, which... Google Play Store and Apple Stores, they, they absolutely, they hate that. <laughs> they hate the demonstration apps. But you can get those through. You just got to put a little story around it. Hopefully, our listeners will be able to go view the source code for these apps um, mm-hmm. on GitHub because it's open source. Mm-hmm. But just like for the sake of the listeners today, can we? can you go into a bit of a short just like user story of what it looks like to use this library and actually see results in your app are like what are you actually doing to get from installing the package to having an ai feature in your app so i have a fantastic uh, and this is just gonna be a plug for my talk at app.js conf Mm -hmm. at app.js conf um i got on stage and i could have just said hey with these few lines of code (laughs) <laughs> you can go ahead and do document scanning. But I feel like that buries what the benefit of this whole kind of process is. So what I did at the talk is I get up there and I go under this whole like situation where the client asks for the ability to scan a document, which is a classic thing. Like I want to scan a check. I want to scan a card. I want to do these things. And then I start going into how you would solve this. And I start talking about the math behind it. I start talking about the science behind it. I start talking about all the different features. And I know all this because here at Infinite Red, we had a client pay us to figure all those things out and implement exactly that. And it was uh, a lesson in in linear algebra. It was a lesson in uh, all kinds of other features. And then I have this moment where we're like, okay, it's possible. Then I have the client ask for magic eraser and running filters and Mm. automatically selecting things. And so when you get to that moment, it's just like, geez, um, we saw how hard it was just to get to step one and they want step five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the beauty of it is on stage, what we do is we import the library and then just doing one asynchronous call saying to load the entire view for the document scanner. And then to bring and the return for that async call is to give us the image result. And then on stage, I actually do the call, scan in front of everybody, and then erase my thumb off of the picture magically, and then bring it back and show it in front of everybody. In just a few lines of very readable code, um, you've taken this first half of my talk where you have this sort of heart attack client ask. And then you go above and beyond in about 15 lines of code and deliver the entire feature. And so I think that that's really cool because all it is is just one call to the React Native library to fire off the document scanner. And I think that that really sells it. That really shows what's going on there because you've included a pipeline of AI, Mm -hmm. which I think is the future. It's not going to be just, oh, I have a chat GPT. I, I have this one thing here. You're going to have hey, I have a virtual concierge hooked to a recommendation engine also going to my webcam to give me virtual try-on. 
So yeah. I can get all these things in one piece. It's going to be a pipeline of AI. And that's kind of like what that experience is with just a few lines of code. That's really cool. Another good example is if, if your app gives the users the ability to upload pictures, I hate that this is the world that we live in, but you need to make sure those pictures are, are good for consumption based on your user base, right? So one big thing in ML kit that we have in the app is um, not safe for work detection. So that's an easy, you know, user uploads an app. Oh, sorry, uploads a picture. Yeah. You run it against, again, just a few lines. You're talking about a lot of lines, few lines. It gives you a green check or a red X. And based on that, you can make a decision on, do you automatically push that picture to go live? Or do you have it in a quote unquote processing state where an actual human needs to come take a look at it and kind of do it. And you alleviate having your, you know, whatever this person is, you want to call them, like having this person sit and look through every single picture mm -hmm. because there's always, you know, one in N that's hidden in there that you probably don't want there, right? So you can right. kind of set those parameters as you want. And another large aspect to this is we found some underlying issues in getting MLKit into production apps. It only works in development currently. But that's what we're working on. That's kind of where you can kind of trust us in this process because we're, we're going full circle here, right? So by the time this app is released, you can com comfortably take any of the ML packages from the, from the repository and use them in your project, knowing that it's going to work in dev and production. And, you know, you can have confidence in it and you can test it out yourself. Dude, Mazen, that's also a great spot to talk about when you're doing something on server versus on device. Yeah. Like... The not safe for work image detection feature is something like if you are going to have a chat app and you're a startup, you don't have tons of funding. Do you have the ability to pay for an entire person to go through and scan all those images and be the moderator of every single aspect of that? That's usually your CEO, Todd. Right. And then you get the uh, <laughs> you get the other thing that happens is you're going to have the um the server costs of running yeah. that on every single image as well. Well, if you have this capability and in just a few lines of code, you could add this in there and it could say, hey, you've received this image from user 238. Uh, we've blurred it because we think that it is 97% sure that you should not open this image. Mm -hmm. Uh, wouldn't that be great if that was a feature and I could, I could click and say like, whatever AI, you don't know what you're talking about. I want this image. <laughs> or I could be like, I don't know who this person is. Yeah. Deny the image and kind of block this person while exactly. we're at it as well. You could build that entire thing and it costs you zero server costs and it runs in just a few lines of code and it's a feature added immediately. This is the, this is idea one of an infinite number of ways that you could apply AI to make products and user experiences even better. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think we're kind of getting to the end of our time. Boo! Um, oh, I know. <laughs> Gant could probably talk about AI all day I, long. Yeah, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> uh, but we'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes to all of the great things that we talked about. I'll, I'll leave you all with a mom joke. Hmm. What kind of felines can bowl? Alley cats. <laughs> chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Chuckle. <laughs> I like the pause you used. I, you the told I was waiting for you to laugh, and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I'm not gonna pause. I'm not gonna laugh until you do that. But the, the pause there, yeah. Pause. Because it's Meow. an alley cat. Rear. Okay. That's right. All right. Someone should stop me. <laughs> <laughs> We will I'll stop you right <laughs> meow. All right, we'll see you all next time. <laughs>our producer and host is Jamin Holmgren, and executive producers and hosts are Robin Hines and Mazen Chami. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check us out at infinite.red slash reactnative. A special thanks to all of you listening today. Make sure to subscribe to React Native Radio wherever you get your podcasts. And leave us a review. We'd love to hear what you think.